This evening we're going to be looking at several different passages. Uh, we won't begin with the reading of them because we will go through them as I go through. Um, so I'll just begin by praying. Thank you, Father, for um, these really bright lights, um, like Roger mentioned. Um, thank you for the beautiful day outside, uh, for the rain we had this morning. Um, thank you for everybody that's here that loves you and um, wants to commit their lives to being a disciple of Jesus. Um, help us to learn this evening. Help me to speak well, um, clearly, um, to make sense. I thank you that um, you care about us and you want our hearts to be encouraged and to be filled with understanding. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Okay, so recently I've been learning a lot um, and trying to explain a lot. As Roger said, or not Roger, Micah said, I'm at uh, Ormacto Baptist Church as their youth coordinator and like summer student pastor. Um, so I'm leading youth group and different Bible studies. Um, so that really tests whether I know what I'm talking about, because the kids ask lots of good questions, and then they ask some strange questions, and those ones you got to answer carefully. And um, I'm now part of a Bible study for people who are just uh, getting into the faith. They want to understand what it means to be a Christian, um, how they can follow God. And so there's a lot of explaining really basic stuff that um, maybe you think everybody knows, but apparently not everybody does. And so that really tests whether I can really articulate my faith. Um, as far as learning a lot, I'm going through two books by C.S. Lewis, and so I get a headache and I stop reading, and then I go on to the next thing, and I'm uh, just reading my Bible kind of day to day, and so I get a lot of things coming into my mind, and the more I learn, the more I realize I don't really know a whole lot of stuff, and there's a whole lot of stuff to be learned, and that's an intimidating thought, and so I'm always wondering... Um, what does God require of me? How much is enough as far as learning goes? Um, where should I allocate my time? Should I be like studying one hour a day or maybe two? And is the Bible enough or do I need another book beside it to give a commentary? And then do I need another book beside that to talk about some other thing? And um, how many people should I be meeting with per week to get instruction from? And you know, is church once a week enough or should it be twice? Like, what does he require of me as far as my life goes so that I can be fruitful, so that I can um, use my time wisely and so that I can um, be an effective communicator, all these things. Um, some of the things that I wrote down, like, is it enough if I can give the highlights of the last 2,000 years of church history? We had a class on that, and that was on the test, so somebody expects me to know it. Um, is it enough that I can trace back the patriarch of the Old Testament and describe their impact um, from generation to generation? Uh, is it enough for me to study the Bible alone or should I be reading books alongside that, as I've said? Um, and what I felt like as I thought through these things that God was um, saying to me is just that he wants disciples. And so I'm like, okay, I know where this guy's going to go, and we already know all this information. But um, I was just simply, he wants disciples. And so my little title up here is Jesus Wants Disciples, Not Dictionaries. So it's not a lot of knowledge that God wants or expects us to have, um, but it's a lifestyle, and it's um, a manner of being. And so I think um, he wants me to share with you guys this thought that he wants disciples. And so I'm going to just look at um, a few different uh, chapters and uh, what they say about being a disciple. So we're going to look at Matthew 28, we're going to look at Matthew 10, John 8, and Matthew 23. So... If you've got four fingers, just like stick them in all those places. Um, but we'll start in Matthew 28. And as well as looking at these verses, in trying to understand what a disciple is, um, I did some research to see what the people, um, uh, when Jesus was on earth, would consider a disciple to be. So I looked uh, as far as like the Jewish perspective on what a disciple was. And that's something I always enjoy doing is seeing what... Um, the contemporary people thought, getting some of the context and understanding like the Jewish perspective on it. Oh, 625 in case you're wondering. Um, so interspersed into this, besides the reading and the obvious the things that we can get from it, I'll be sharing some of the stuff that I learned. Um, so turning to Matthew 28, uh, we'll read verses 16 to, the, uh, to 20. 
Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Good job, guys. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Okay. So concerning Matthew 28, we see, and that was the verse that just immediately came to my mind, like disciples of all nations. So that at the beginning is what God expects us to be and to be encouraging other people to be. So um, from that, let's just realize though first that Jesus wasn't the only one with disciples. Um, from our perspective, we just look at Jesus because that's who we've got in the Bible. And then we think about his disciples because they're the ones most spoken of. Um, but it's not like he was the first guy to make that up. The um, Pharisees had disciples. We see that in Matthew 22. And also John the Baptist had disciples. And lots of rabbis, lots of teachers had disciples. And so they were people who followed them around. And it wasn't like coming... I don't know, to hear your favorite speaker at like a conference or something. You guys had the Gospel Coalition or something um, last week. It, it wasn't like that. So Micah isn't a disciple of like the speakers there. He just hears what they have to say. He's like, okay, that's cool, and benefits from it and learns. But it's not that he was exactly their disciples. A disciple was somebody who gave up their uh, circumstances, and they would follow around this guy uh, learn from him through his actions, learn th from him through what he said, and learn from him just by observing his life. So um, Jesus wasn't the only one with disciples that followed him around. Other people had them. So let's remember that. Um, this will be significant at a later point besides being interesting right now. Also, Jesus' command in Matthew 28 for us to go into the world and make disciples was not a new idea. Um, but for us, it is significant, more significant, because in the making of disciples, we are not simply sharing a good story or helpful life advice. We are bringing people to know um, the one true God and into a relationship with his son, the word made flesh. Jesus' command, go ye therefore and teach all nations, or in the NIV, make disciples of, is paralleled by the rabbinical dictum, raise up many disciples. So we've got Matthew 28, 19 from Jesus, and then Mishnah Avot 1, 3. So, um, and that was something that I learned in my studies. So Jesus' um, statement to do that, making disciples, is something that we think like, okay, like this is our great commission. This is our job. We want to make disciples. We want to tell other people. But it wasn't, again, a new thing. Like, all the other rabbis were saying, like, okay, my disciples, share my knowledge with other people. And just like maybe we hear, uh, I don't know, a good thing if you're on Facebook, um, you hear something cool, like how to cook something neat, you go tell all your friends, and, like, you disseminate interesting information, like, that is about as good as the disciples of other rabbis could be. Like, they could just share good information. But when we're sharing Jesus with other people, when we're sharing the truth from God, um, it's more significant. So even though it was something that lots of people were encouraging to do, it took on more significance, and it takes on more significance for us because we're sharing Jesus with people, okay? And a final interest for Matthew 28, though the New Testament is written in Greek, Jesus' command here to make disciples would have been understood the same way by the contemporary Jews. The Greek mathetes means learner, just as the Hebrew talmud means learner or student, and so that's the word for a disciple. Okay, now we're going to go to Matthew 10, and I'm going to read a lot. I'm going to start at verse 1. Starting at verse 1, and he called to him his 12 disciples, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. And then moving to verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. And then to verse 16. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to the courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brothers will deliver brother over to death and father his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will have not gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant to be like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. For every one who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Okay, thanks for listening. That was a lot of reading. Um, but if you're trying to figure out what's it going to be like if you want to be a disciple of Jesus, read Matthew 10. And some of it's kind of cool. Um, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. That sounds kind of neat. Um, but the rest of it sounds kind of horrible. You know, mother betraying the daughter. Uh, in verse 34, not peace but a sword. It's sounding kind of tumultuous. Um, the disciple is going to be treated poorly by people around them. Um, but then also, don't fear. Nothing is escaping God's view. Nothing is covered that won't be revealed or hidden that won't be known. God knows what's going on. When you're thrown in front of the governors, his spirit is there with you. So there's some good stuff and there's some bad stuff and there's some stuff that Jesus is trying to console them with, but he wants them to really understand what they're getting themselves into. Because as a disciple, you really take on the uh, lifestyle of the one whom you follow. And so all these things are what Jesus encounters. So if you want to follow Jesus, you get the privilege of being like him. Because it says the disciple, it is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher. But you also get all that comes with the uh, life of the teacher. So all of the threats, all of the attacks against Jesus are what the disciple gets. So Jesus always wanted his disciples to be completely aware of what they were getting themselves into. Um, but let's just focus on two portions. And so the, ver the first portion, verses 24 and 25, so a disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house, Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So Jesus is outlining the relationship that his disciples have uh, with him and warning them just as they follow and imitate Jesus that others like the people mentioned in the previous verses, do not follow God and seem to want to cause the disciples harm um, because they are imitators of Beelzebul or Satan. Beelzebul is an interesting word. Um, it's kind of a word that transitioned, and it was originally like Baalzebul, and so it meant a few different things. Um, it can either mean Lord of the dwelling or Lord of dung. And in the form of Lord of Dung, it was sort of the Jewish people saying all the other idols 
um, the most evil one, in their opinion, was Baal. And so he was the captain of all the dumb idols. So he's the Lord of Dung, or the Lord of the Flies is another translation. So it was kind of a way to despise them and say it wasn't a good thing, to these idols. But in another way, Lord of the Dwelling is to say that, the, that Satan is kind of the chief of all the demons. He's the uh, head of it all. And it seems like Jesus is referring to Satan as Lord of the Dwelling because he calls him the master of the house. And so from my research, I learned that the disciples and their rabbi or teacher were in a special relationship so that the disciples were taken in as basically the rabbi's family. And the disciples would revere and follow their rabbi more than their own father and mother. So the idea of teacher and master of the house were two ways of saying the same thing. Jesus was both the teacher and master of his disciples. But the same is true for those who do not follow Jesus and practice evil. They are both under teaching and authority of Satan or Beelzebul, the Lord of the dwelling. So that is true for us, not the second part, but the first. In our understanding of what God requires of us, he wants us to learn from him as well as understand that we are to learn from Jesus. But to the same degree that Jesus is our teacher, Jesus is also our master and the most important and significant person to us, even above our father or mother. As our master and teacher, we are also a part of Jesus' family, since he is symbolically the master of our house as our rabbi. I thought it was interesting as I prepared this because I've got in here a lot rabbi. We don't really use that word as Christians. We use maybe teacher or savior or these kind of things to refer to Jesus, but we don't really use the Jewish word rabbi. But um, to understand a lot of these things, you do have to get into that. And so as we go along, um, every time I use the word rabbi, just think about what that actually means, the significance of the rabbi, that we are a part of Jesus' family, but he's also the master of us, and our actions um, reflect on him, and his actions actually change and reflect on us. An interesting thing I learned was ordinarily disciples were the apprentices of the rabbi in a particular trade as well as in the study of religion. So there was one famous rabbi who was a blacksmith, and all his students under him were blacksmiths as well. And there is encouragement in the thought that we who follow Jesus today can also fulfill our roles as his disciples, even in the everyday aspects of our lives. So even in our jobs, we can be disciples of Jesus, because the rabbis just did their job, and their disciples followed along with them. And that's the image that we get here. Um, so we can accomplish this by emulating him in everything we undertake. And so that brings us to the second portion, because I said there were two things to focus on in chapter 10. Um, the second portion is verses 19b and verse 20. So I say b because um, the context is being delivered over before, um, like, um, governors and kings, but... We're going to apply it more broadly. Do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Another role that the disciple had was as a representative. The disciples' actions reflected on the rabbi, and the actions of the rabbi reflected on the disciples. So as Jesus' disciples, our actions reflect on who he is to the world around us, and his actions reflect, and even further, change who we are. Again, because the disciple was a part of the rabbi's family, the actions of the disciples were seen as actions of the rabbi's family as a whole, and of the rabbi himself. This was taken even to the point where disciples could stand for the rabbi in court proceedings um, or in law cases. This is also why Jesus says in verse 40, uh, of chapter 10, whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me, because we are actually Jesus' representatives, and Jesus doesn't just mean it in a figurative way, like, say what I would say, or, you know, encourage them, because I'm encouraging, like, he's saying, you are actually me in that position, so act like it. Don't screw it up, but also remember that I'm with you. So 
when you get sent before the governor, don't worry, you're not all alone. I haven't left you there to just kind of try your best. I am with you in spirit. So don't be afraid of what you're going to say. And for me, that was really encouraging. In understanding what God requires of us, he requires that we understand that we are his representatives here on earth. And 2 Corinthians 5, 19, I'll just flip there. And if you're fast, you can get there too. He entrusting to us the message, he has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. In verse 20, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Again, it's not a figurative thing. We are actually the ambassadors of Christ. We are actually his representatives. God is actually making his appeal to the world through us. But we don't do this job on our own. As I've said, I often tend to allow myself to get overwhelmed when I think about being Jesus' representative. And I bet that maybe one or two of you also get concerned about that as well. Like you're going to talk to your friend and they don't know God and they kind of think you're crazy or they're concerned for you because maybe you're saying some stuff that they think is unhealthy for you. I don't know. And you're representing God. So you've got to answer their questions or you've got to turn back their um, statements of like against God. And so I get worried about thinking whether I'll be able to explain um, and the most worrying is the endless possibility of the questions and contentions they can bring up. Um, this week, I was with Emily and her family, um, and they don't know I'm telling a story about them, but here we go. Um, we were at a family reunion, and some of their family aren't Christian, and I wanted to be a good representative. I'm a disciple, and so I'm going to be a representative. And I did some things that maybe they didn't think were a good representative. I played a joke, but anyways. But it was really concerning because a lot of their family are really smart. Um, some of them are college educators, and so I'm like, oh, they're going to have really good questions for me, and I'm going to look like a doofus, and Jesus is going to be poorly represented. Um, that didn't happen because we were quite busy the whole time, but it's just the thought of that that concerned me. And when we actually did get to talk, we had some good conversations, and they weren't as uh, scary and intimidating as I thought, but I also tried to remember, like, God promises that don't be anxious how you will speak, whatever you will say, for what you will say will be given to you in that hour. And I tried to really trust God in that and just go into the conversations um, believing him. Um, so as Jesus representatives, we cannot forget that we go out with his spirit and that as we read, he promises to be with us even to the end of the age. He doesn't send us out and say, hope you don't die. He sends us out and goes with us through his spirit and has the same confidence in us that God had in him as he expresses in John 20, 21. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. And that was something that I really try to remember as well, that um, I don't think God sent out Jesus like, hey man, if you get like 60% of this mission done, that'll be enough, like good day. Like, I'm pretty sure when God sent out his word into the earth, he was like, I know that you're going to accomplish everything. And it seems like a silly thing, like, does God talk to himself? But, like, just work with me here. As the Father has sent me, so God sent Jesus out, so I'm sending you. If God really believed, and I think he did, that Jesus was going to accomplish all that he had sent him out to do, we read in the, uh, I think in Isaiah, I have sent out my word and it will not return void. Like, God is confident that Jesus will do all that he said he should do. And so if Jesus is saying, as the Father has sent me, so I send you, in that I read Jesus' confidence in us. And not like, yeah, Nigel, I know that you're able to do this just because you're really cool or whatever, but like, I'm sending my spirit with you. If you trust me, if you believe me, this thing's going to work. We're going to do it. You're going to be my representative. I'm not leaving you alone. Don't be anxious. It's going to happen. So be encouraged. And remember, you're his representative. Okay, let's go to John chapter 8. A lot less reading here, so don't worry. Uh, just looking at verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, 
and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Great. The Jews who are listening kind of take it in another direction. They're like, we've never been slaves, so that doesn't matter to us. And Jesus is like, well, actually, if you've sinned, you are a slave. But I'm focusing on, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciple. Um, I don't know about you, but I think about that a lot. I'm like, okay, Jesus just says, like, just think about what he said. Like, we read in Psalm 1, like, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And Jesus is saying the same thing here. If you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples. Jesus makes it clear that just as we are to learn from our teacher when he acts or speaks, we are also to remain, abide in what he said. As I researched, I found a lot of importance was placed on the role of the rabbi as a teacher. And of course, the word means teacher, but as in contrast to the rabbi being somebody to emulate. As his disciples today, we believers ought to learn, meditate on, and indeed memorize, I'm sorry, this is a quote, uh, the teachings of Jesus. In taking care to emphasize the fact that Jesus is our divine Savior, we sometimes neglect the riches of his earthly teaching ministry. And I think that was really shown to me this morning in Sunday school. So can I take you to Sunday school this morning? I, we were reading, I think, Philippians 3, and it was talking, uh, Paul was like, I count it all as nothing um, for what Christ has done. And Paul was talking about fulfilling the law in there. So I asked, like, what, is, what had Christ done? And I think the answer is Christ lived the perfect life, and he filled the whole law. And so that's why Paul's like, I don't care about uh, me fulfilling the law, because Jesus did it for him. And so I think that's the, what he has done. So I asked the whole class, though, what do you think Jesus has done? And they're like, he died for our sins. He rose again. And it's true, and it also does tie into there because, because Jesus died and rose for our sins, we don't have to pay for our own. But they never mentioned anything about his life. They never mentioned that he lived a perfect life or that he fulfilled the whole law or that he didn't come to abolish it but to fulfill the whole thing. And so I think that this quote is really true, and this is from one of the articles I read, that we often... Uh, focus on Jesus' death and resurrection, and we know that really well, and that's good, but we can sometimes miss all of the very important things that he said in his teaching about how we should conduct our lives, about how we should relate to him, and just things like that. So as much as I will focus on us needing to be like Jesus, uh, we also must remember the balance, which is we need to learn what Jesus has said and live in it. Not go looking for something else or something better, but seek to understand and live out his words, because they are always better. John 10, 10. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And what I meant to convey there is like, when we read something over and over again, we're like, okay, I think I know that, that's fine. What's something cooler? What's something more interesting? And Paul writes to Timothy, like, in the last days, they'll have like itching ears, always desiring the new thing. And if what Jesus says to you isn't that interesting or not that important, you don't need a new thing. You need to read it again and figure out what is so important about it. It's you that needs to change. And I'm making the case that if he came that we may have life and have it abundantly, then the life in his words that we need to abide in, it's there. And if you can't see it, just keep looking and ask and he will reveal it to you, okay? Okay. Now we will go to Matthew 23, so go back, and we're going to read 12 verses. Just to recap, in John 8, what does God require of us? He requires that we live in the words of Jesus, abide there. I looked it up in Greek, it actually means live, it just means abide, nothing else. Okay, so now to Matthew 23, starting in verse 1. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees, sit on Moses' seat. Okay? So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do, for they preach and do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, 
but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the seat and the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you are all for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Okay, so Matthew 23. We're going to focus on verse 8. And the understanding we get from the first part. So verse 8, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. So does Jesus really care about the word rabbi? Like is it immediately evil as soon as he entered the earth or what's going on? And I would suggest it's something else. So what is Jesus talking about here? He is calling out the scribes and Pharisees for pride and basically stealing attention and authority from God. We see that Jesus is nothing wrong with people teaching other people the law and, in fact, encourages that the people obey their teaching, right? They sit on the seat of Moses, so listen to what they say. So Jesus isn't trying to undermine their authority. He's not trying to say, like, don't listen to these guys. Be my disciple. I'm better. Like, it's, it's not that. He's talking about something different. He is not simply trying to make followers for himself. He is taking issue with their actions and the position they take among the people, Rabbi is just the word for teacher, and I don't think Jesus really means that we can never call anyone by the title of teacher, but the connotation for the people at that time was more than just a teacher. Uh, the people, as I've already said, would become attached to their rabbi, and in a sense, he would become their whole avenue for experiencing God and relating to God. Whatever the rabbi taught was what the people believed without question, and they loved that to the point of excess. The rabbis loved it to the point of excess. We see um, they loved the place of honor. They loved the best seats in the synagogue. They liked to walk around and have the people be like, oh, I depend on you, rabbi, good to see you. Like, and so it's too much. And Jesus is saying, in that way that you relate to them, you can't do that anymore. And this is another quote here from Joshua Moss. Jesus taught that such a relationship was wrong. He told his disciples, no. I am to be the only and constant object of your devotion and affection. I am your example, your teacher, the one you represent, and the only one you shall follow. Some other interesting facts about the disciple-rabbi relationship can be found in the Mishnah, and this helps us better understand the issue that Jesus has with um, calling them, uh, calling other people rabbi. So we're going to read from the Mishnah, which is a Jewish uh, writing, when one is searching for the lost property, both of his father and of his teacher, his teacher's loss takes precedence over that of his father, since his father brought him only into the life of this world, whereas his teacher taught him wisdom, i.e. Torah, and has brought him into the life of the world to come. Okay. But if his father is no less a scholar than his teacher, then his father's loss takes precedence. If his father and his teacher are in captivity, he must ransom his teacher first. So this is the extent. Did you just like, because eh. that, that's what I did. I was like, what? Like, I'm going to take my dad out of jail before this like random teacher guy. Like, when you were in school, were you like, yeah, Mrs. Whoever, you over anybody? Like, I don't think so. But that's their relationship to them. So when Jesus is saying, uh, you can't call them rabbi. Like, he's saying, you can't have this devotion to them that's like above everybody else. That's no longer acceptable. Another quote by David Biven, uh, and it's kind of extensive, but I thought it just explained something really well. If the thought that someone could ransom his teacher before his own father seems shocking, it is only because we do not understand the tremendous love and respect that disciples and the community at large had for their sages or rabbis. Similarly, Jesus not allowing a prospective disciple to say goodbye to his family before setting out to follow him may seem cruel. And I think most of you remember places where Jesus said things like that. 
Um, however, Jesus' first century contemporaries would have seen this as quite reasonable and normal. What Jesus meant would have been perfectly clear to them when he said, no one can be my disciple who does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Jesus is trying to pull the people away from the rabbis they had in the worship and the idolization of them to say, if you're going to follow God and follow him through me, because he's the way, the truth, and the life, you're going to have to do it without somebody else. You can't have your favorite rabbi who you devote your life to and follow me. And we see that this was really difficult for some of them to understand, because even Paul writes about it. He says, like, uh, now you say some follow Peter, and I follow Apollos, and I follow Paul. So the people were even in the church having a difficult time, like, no, Jesus is the only one, and everybody else is just helpful, but not the one. Um, and it's because of just how this was ingrained in them. They wanted some guy to follow and be their all. But as disciples of Jesus, he needs to be our all. So learning this was quite challenging for me um, because I had read the passages before where Jesus tells us to count the cost of following him. But learning the degree to which the people of his time took it, again, caused me to make sure I am really willing to go that far. So, and again, remembering what does God require of us as his disciples, I would encourage anyone who wants to become a disciple of Jesus to do so. Become a disciple. It's a good thing. But realize what you're signing up for. He's the only one, and there's nobody else. It's not another good idea. It's not an addition onto something else. Jesus says, I'm it. You can't have another rabbi. You can't have another teacher you devote your life to. It's just him saying it. It's not my idea. God requires that we seek after him and live as a disciple of Jesus above all else. Okay, final point. I've got three minutes. <laughs> and this one's kind of encouraging so we can smile and like be excited. Um, it's something that I don't think we appreciate very much. So we've read all of this, and it got me thinking. Like, So back at the beginning, right? Jesus is not the only one with disciples. But we might have the perspective that he is because we only look at him, and we now are trained up to just follow Jesus. We're disciples of Jesus, nobody else. And so that's really easy for us to get. Being, and so the final point, being a disciple is being, being a part of Jesus' family and being like Jesus. So Matthew 10, 24 again, it is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher. And that's an amazing thing because for the first time in history, we have the one to teach us. We have the great teacher, the great rabbi. We now not only have someone from whom we can learn Torah, but also someone who can and should who we can and should emulate absolutely. He taught as one who had authority and not as the scribes. That's Matthew 7, 29. And this just struck me, not last night, yeah, last night. I was just thinking about this. Like, up to this point, they were clinging on to these rabbis, right? You had your rabbi, and you followed him around, you sacrificed, you wanted to learn Torah, you wanted to become a better person, you wanted to learn about the world to come, you wanted to have wisdom, and it was a good thing. And I don't think God was like angry at them for trying to learn. But now that Jesus has come, we're done with all these other guys as people that you follow with your whole life. Because now you've got the one to follow with your whole life. Now you've got the one like, you don't need anybody else anymore. And it's just, like, such a shift that we are so far in the future from that it's not even something that we've transitioned out of. Like, they transitioned from, like, looking for the best guy they could find to understand things from to now we've got the dude. We've got the one. And I wanted to do a little example up here of having, like, maybe one of you with a little group around you. And then, but just understand, like, because their rabbi was the person with, from, uh, through whom they connected to God. It's like me and my five friends, we're all following around Mr. Papard, and he is like reading the Torah, and he's describing to us this like mystical God who's a little difficult to understand. He talks in allegories, and we don't know what's going on, but we just try our best. And he's doing a pretty good job, and God's like, hey, good job, because you're trying to teach my people. But then we get God, just like Mr. Papard, move out of the way, please. Uh, I'm here now. And we get Jesus, and he comes down, and he's like, okay, 
now that I'm here, you don't need all these other guys. You can just talk to me. You can learn from me. And so Jesus says, take my yoke upon me, upon you, and learn from me. And so again, the Gospel Coalition, they had this little conference. Micah goes and he learns all these great things. That's fine. That's good. You hear Pastor Terry. You're listening to me right now. Hey, whatever. If I say good things, listen. If I don't, throw it away. But I'm not the one. I'm not your only source of information. You now get to listen to God's Spirit and you get to talk to the one himself. I don't know. Just think about that. Before Jesus, there were lots of men and women that people looked up to, learned from, depended on for guidance. But when Jesus came, we got for the first and last time a human that we should model our whole lives around and actually become like. <clears throat> Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He didn't want us to be conformed to the image of like Rabbi so-and-so. He wants us to be conformed to the image of his son, and he's our rabbi, the firstborn among many brothers. The Jews focused a lot on learning Torah from their rabbis and learning their interpretation and explanation of the law. But now, not only can we learn from our rabbi, but we can become like him and know him and know that becoming like him is God's desire for our lives. We've got Ephesians 4. 13, until we all, and so this is the job of uh, teachers, until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the full stature of the fullness of Christ. That's who we're becoming like. Be imitators of God as beloved children. We get to become like him. Okay. So, we are disciples. We are representatives of God, of Jesus. He doesn't leave us alone, and he really means that we're his representatives. We are part of his family. Our actions reflect on him, and his actions change us. When you go home, reflect on the privilege it is to have the great teacher and the great rabbi, the great example. Be thankful that our rabbi, our teacher, is not merely an earthly teacher, who only gives us guidance through word and deed, but also able to give us his spirit to be able to be with us and aid us in remembering his teaching and show us what we should do and say. And as you're reading the Gospels uh, specifically, and when you see what Jesus says, like just stop and think, my rabbi is speaking. And just try and like, I don't know, get into the significance of that, like the weight of that. And I trust that you already, like, care a lot when you see what Jesus is saying. But just try and, like, get into the weight of all that your rabbi speaking means. Okay? I'm done. I guess I'll just pray. Is there uh, another hymn? Yeah? Okay. A little abrupt ending. My dad's laughing at me. <laughs> Father, um, thank you that you can work with what I've said and um, hopefully make sense of it. Thank you, Jesus, that you did come and that we get to look to you and we get to become like you. Thank you that you're our teacher. Thank you that you care about us. Thank you that you see us, Father. Thank you for the privilege of becoming your disciples, Jesus. Thank you for the privilege of being your representatives. Thank you for the privilege of giving us your spirit to be with us, to help us, to encourage us, to give us the words to say. Help us to take seriously uh, this, I guess, invitation of Jesus to be his disciples, but also all that goes with it. Um, help me to take it seriously and to live it out, Father. Thank you, and we love you.